In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are certain gospel readings that every priest dreads to see in the lectionary. And it may come as no surprise to you that, for me, this is one of the readings that I dread to see in our lectionary. As you know, our readings um, for, for, that we do every single day of the week, not just on Sundays, are assigned readings. We do not get to pick them. And there are some that are easy to preach on, like last week's. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Wow, I could preach for hours on that verse alone. And there are others that are more difficult to preach on. And so this year, when I was planning my vacation, I was very happy to see that the reading on divorce fell on the week that I was going to be away. How ecstatic I was. Until this Sunday I realized and was reminded that this reading comes up more than once in our lectionary. So I had thought that I had avoided needing to preach on it, but here we are. I think there's something very special, something very important about the fact that we do not get to choose the readings that we read every day, and ultimately as preachers, the passages that we're going to preach on. It would be very easy to ignore the more challenging parts of Scripture and to gravitate towards the ones that make us feel good. However, the entirety of the Gospels is truly a Gospel is truly a word of good news. And if we read these passages properly, I think that we can gain such a deeper understanding of the love that God has for us by not avoiding the difficult passages. Of course, today's reading is about divorce. It is about the fact that even though in the Jewish law it was permissible to get a certificate of divorce and to obtain a divorce, Christ seems to come back with a different response. What's the context of this reading? The context is that the Pharisees approach Jesus and unsolicited they come to him with a question that the text says is to test him. And so they say, oh teacher, you know Moses in his law that he gave us said that it's permissible for a man to divorce his wife. He simply needs to write a certificate of divorce. And Jesus responds in a very interesting way. He says, only for your hardness of heart did Moses allow this. We see already that the Pharisees in Christ are talking on two different levels. The Pharisees are talking on the level of what can I get away with? Christ already is raising the bar to if you're just living your life based on what is permissible, you're going to miss out on the blessings and the gifts that God has in store for you. If you limit your behavior to simply coloring within the lines, your life is going to be so much less rich. And he goes on. He goes on and he quotes the words of Scripture. Remember the Pharisees came to him and said, Moses in his law said it was permissible to divorce. Christ responds by quoting other words of Moses. Words that go back to the book of Genesis. Right? In the Jewish tradition, the first five books of the Bible, tradition purports were penned by Moses. And so Christ goes and he quotes some more words that Moses has to say. And of course, we are, I think, more familiar with this story where right after the creation of man and woman, we hear that God made them male and female, and that for this reason the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one body. So they are no longer two, but one body. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So we see within the Jewish law given by Moses, that there seems to be a contradiction. On the one hand, um, it's clear that there are situations in which um, it's allowed, it's permissible for a couple to be divorced, and yet on the other hand, there is a harsh warning against doing so, saying what God has joined together, 
let not man separate. There's what's permissible, and there's what's ideal. And there's a sharp distinction between the two. But Christ goes on to further clarify, and we might say even harsh and even more, the words that we see in the book of Genesis when he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Very harsh words to our ears. Many of us are either divorced ourselves or we know people close to us who have been divorced. And so these words hit us hard. And of course, we hear these words out of the same mouth of Jesus, who also says to love your enemy, and to pray for those who persecute you, and to forgive your neighbor 70 times 7, right? It seems to us jarring that we would hear such harsh words from the mouth of Christ. And yet, Christ gives a very specific description of what divorce is. He compares it with adultery. And when we hear that in our ear, we might ask the question, where else does Jesus talk about adultery? And we get brought to another part of Scripture, another part of the Gospels, that actually is even more harsh than Christ's words about marriage. And Jesus' most famous sermon, his largest teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, we hear the way in which what we might see as a seemingly harmless behavior being given the same description. Christ says the following words, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We see that the standards of Christ are indeed high. I think our issue with this reading about divorce is more um, rooted in the fact that we don't take the rest of Christ's teaching with the same weight. How often, on the one hand, do we look at divorce with such judgment, and yet we look at lust as something that's normal, as something that is just part of the human condition that's unavoidable, and yet Christ compares both of these with adultery. Why does he do that? Why does he make this harsh comparison? Is it because he's trying to make us feel horrible about ourselves and trying to make it impossible to come to his love? Not at all. But rather, it's because Christ acknowledges and he's showing to us the incredible, unimaginable dignity of the human person. That so often in our society, in our world, whether it has to do with romantic relationships, or it has to do with legal transactions, or it has to do with other societal structures, instead of treating people as subjects, we treat them as objects. We treat people as disposable. We treat people as ends to a mean, or a means to an end instead of as an end in and of themselves. Was at the heart of Christ's teaching about divorce is his teaching about marriage. That you are looking at marriage simply as a legal contract between two parties. And that if both parties consent, you should be able to dissolve this union. But what Christ is saying is that through God, through the blessing of God, something even more incredible happens when you come to be married. That these two people who were separate, now in some way beyond our comprehension, become one. Become united in a way that we cannot understand. In other parts of the scripture, we hear St. Paul talking about the fact that the greatest icon, the greatest image that we can have of marriage, or of, of Christ and his love for his church in this world, is the love between a husband and a wife. What Christ is doing in this teaching is not so much about condemning divorce as it is about exalting marriage. In the society where men dominated over women, 
by using marriage as something to be bought and sold with a simple piece of paper, something that unfortunately is also plaguing our society currently. There are some people, of course, who are in extreme situations that divorce is the only reasonable option. But there are many others among us that we know where divorce is simply seen as one among many options of how to deal with marital disputes. This way of looking at marriage, of no-fault divorce, of looking at marriage and saying this is something disposable, what that does is it makes the institution of marriage completely dissolved. It makes it irrelevant. If marriages can be broken at any time, what does that commitment even mean? What does it truly mean that the two become one if they can become separated at any time for any given reason? Ultimately, this is about the dignity of persons. That if I truly see you as an image of God, as I see you as an immortal being who has been created for the purpose of receiving and extending God's love throughout the universe, if that's how I see you, I'm going to think twice before treating you in such a way. I'm going to take this seriously. And I think that was at the heart of Jesus' teaching here is about taking both marriage and divorce as serious matters. Because we take the other person seriously. We take the effect that this is going to have on their lives seriously. I think that Jesus' teaching on divorce may have looked different if the Pharisees had brought to him a specific couple and explained the extenuating circumstances that they were dealing with. However, the Pharisees were just trying to get a rule so that they could justify their actions to God. That they didn't need to consider their wives before divorcing them and you just throw them out like a piece of garbage. That's what Christ is fighting against. And to me, that's a hopeful message. That's a message of such good news that we have such value that, yes, we should be given the dignity of the respect of being treated as persons and not as objects. I think at the heart of what makes this reading difficult for us is that often we come in front of God trying to justify ourselves to Him. That is not why we are here. Going back to his second example from the Sermon on the Mount, I am certainly, at this point, not guilty of the first accusation of divorce, but I certainly am guilty of the second. I certainly have throughout my life, in many ways, as I think many of us, if not all of us have, treated others as objects instead of as subjects. Looked at them lustfully instead of looking at them as an immortal soul, a creation of God. So yes, I am guilty of adultery. And maybe most of us in the sanctuary are. If we come into the sanctuary trying to justify ourselves before God, and say, no, I'm not guilty, God, then we are not opening ourselves up to his mercy, to his love. Our goal, brothers and sisters, in coming here is not to justify our behavior in front of God, but to allow his grace to justify us. That's the good news. The good news is that, yes, though I and others are adulterers here in this sanctuary, we have a loving God who can come and heal the brokenness within our souls. What a blessing, what a gift, that there is hope for my wretched soul. That there is hope for the wounds within myself, within the distortions of that love, of that image that God created me to live in. I think that if we read this reading with this heart, it does indeed become a word of good news. Whether or not we've been divorced, no matter what our life experiences are, and so, brothers and sisters, I pray that each and every one of us have the strength to come humbly in front of the Lord and to realize that it's okay that we're broken and that that's ultimately why we're here, isn't it? Glory to the God who accepts us in our deepest brokenness and our deepest wounds. 
May we allow Him to come and see us as we are, provide His healing upon us, and ultimately, for that reason, we can give Him true praise and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.